one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. And a and lame man from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at, it, at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting <coughs> to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I, what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them to the portio, portio called Solomon's Portio, utterly astonished. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Please thank It's a marvelous story. It's a marvelous account of the power of God Almighty. Amen? Amen? How would we feel if all of a sudden the doors of this sanctuary burst open and a man came not just walking in, but running and leaping and praising God and just you know, caused all kinds of chaos. What would we think? Well, it's a wonderful, wonderful account. And so I could say, all right, what is the response of the congregation? How would we respond? But I want to kind of put it in context 
about you and me. Sometimes I think that we look to people like Peter and John to do such things as that. Let's set the story once again. This man every day came to the temple, was brought to the temple, it says. And he was brought at the ninth hour. That's the hour of prayer. That's when good Jews came and they prayed in the temple. They prayed three times a day. But in this third hour, or the ninth hour at three in the afternoon, it was, it was a time that was ordinary. It was something that, the, that happened every day. Three o'clock in the afternoon, people would come to pray. And so this man is at the door of the temple. I want to talk about the man just for a minute. Because here was a man who came every day, and he came for the express, express purpose of begging for alms. Now, we get them on the street corners. We get them on the sides of the road. People who are there begging for alms. And we can go practically every day the route that we travel home or whatever, and we can see these people. Amen? Amen. This man came to the door of the temple. Why? At the beautiful gate. This was a wide gate, a broad gate, by the way. But he came to the gate. It would be very easy for people to walk to the other side, to go by him. But he was there. Why? Why is it that, that people come to the church? We had a family that came not too long ago. They came here. They were destitute. They had been burned out of their home. They needed food. It happened to be at the time that we had fellowship meal, and so we fed them. They needed a place to stay. They needed gas in their car, and we went and we did that. And I think that that's why this beggar goes to the gate of the temple because that's how Christians are supposed to be. We're supposed to be loving and we're supposed to be giving. Amen? Amen. Somebody who's in need, we need to meet that need as best that we can. A lot of people probably walked by him. I was reading about the beautiful gate. It's very, it's very wide. And so it would be very easy to walk by them. How many times do you and I see someone who is in need, someone who's not dressed so well, and we walk by them. How many times do we see people in need on the highway and we drive by them? I always, whenever I do that, there, you know, I pray, I say, Lord, if I'm supposed to stop, let me know. Amen? Amen? Because there's just so many. There are people out there that will take advantage of you and so forth. And we need to be guided by God. But here's this man who comes to the gate. And I don't think that Peter and John woke up and said, well, let's go out today and see if we can do some kind of miracles. My because it was the third hour, the ninth hour, because it was three in the afternoon, it says that Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. To do what? To pray. To be in the temple. That was the ordinary thing for them to do. Let me give you some things that I want to share with you today. Number one is this. God works in the ordinary times in our lives. Now this was a time when Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. And God intervened. In their path was this beggar. From all evidence that we see it was just an ordinary day. How many of us have ordinary days? This is a different day. Sabbath is a different day. Amen? Amen. And it's supposed to be different. But what about the other six days? 
when I was uh, going up and, and helped take care of my mother, uh, my sister told me, now mom has a routine. She always does laundry on Monday and does ironing on Tuesday. And so when I would go and sit with her, I knew that on Monday she was going to be busy washing. That was the ordinary thing for her to do. Well, there are things in our lives. You know, we talk about days that we do laundry. I said to Margie, when are you going to do laundry this week? Well, probably Thursday, because Thursday is the ordinary day for her to do laundry. And invariably, she'll come back from that time down there in that laundromat, and she'll say, well, I ran into so-and-so today, and we had a wonderful discussion. And then there'll be other days that she can go down and take the two hours that it takes to do the laundry and come back. Did you see anybody? No. Ordinary things that you and I do. We have a schedule. Those of you that have a job where you have to be there at a particular time. You do it five days a week unless, like our schools were off on Friday. <clears throat> but that was not an ordinary day. An ordinary day is getting up in the morning, going to work, coming home. Right? Sometimes God works in those ordinary times in our lives. We love the mountaintops, the mount, those mountaintop experiences. I loved going to Promise Keepers. I loved going to men's conferences. I loved going to general conferences, to association. Those are special times. Those are high times for me. In Matthew, we are told the, the account of, of Jesus going to the Mount of Transfiguration. And taking Peter, James, and John with him. And you know, when he saw, when they saw Jesus with Moses and Elijah, Peter jumps up and he goes, Hey, this is a great place to be, and we'll just stay right here. I'll build three huts one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, and we'll just groove right here. And it says, Before the words even got out of his mouth, Moses and Elijah were gone, and Jesus was leading them down off the mountain. And immediately when they got down off the mountain, they encountered a man whose son was a demoniac. Wow. You know what? The mountaintop experiences are great. We look forward to them. But you know what? The mountaintop experiences are to prepare us for ministry in the valley. Because that's where we live and that's where we minister. Amen? Amen. And, and in those ordinary things that you and I do, my question is how many of us in the ordinary times of our lives, in those ordinary days, when we're just simply doing what we do, have done every day, are we ready for God to intervene and to reveal Himself to us in maybe the form of a beggar or maybe the form in the form of of a woman who is struggling, or a man who is struggling. Do we walk by him, or her, or them? You see, I think that sometimes we miss so much because we have our minds, we have our eyes, we have our hearts set in a particular pattern. I don't know about you, but I don't like change. I really struggle with change. I like things in an orderly manner. But God invariably inserts into my life at times when I don't expect it some pretty extraordinary things. It might be a person encountered at the post office or in the store or at Panera Bread. Because one day I was there, Margaret and I went, and I got my cup of coffee, and the young man that was waiting on me, he said, I have a question for you. And I forget now what the question was, but it was theological in nature. 
And here not too long ago, he said, you know, we're starting a new church in Bowie. And we're meeting out at the stadium. And our first service is on Sunday. That was a couple of weeks ago. Well, okay, you know, praise God. But he was excited about it. And in his excitement, he and I got to talking. I asked him how it went. He said, oh, it was wonderful. And he went through the motions and tried to tell me, but at the same time, there's a line of people. And he says, I can't talk now. I said, I understand. I understand. Are we ready for God to break into our ordinary lives with some extraordinary stuff? I think that's what happened here. Peter and John going to the temple at the time of prayer to pray. <clears throat> and they encountered this man. Sometimes God works in extraordinary ways on, on ordinary days. Sometimes the Holy Spirit comes with flames of fire. There are other times that He comes as a great wind. But sometimes God also works just in everyday ways. <clears throat> they were on their way to church. I believe that God wants to do miraculous things in our lives. Man. Not just on the mountaintops of revival, not just at promise keepers or men's conference or general conference. But I believe that He wants to do something marvelous with us in those everyday, in the valley kind of experiences that we have. John Henry Newman wrote these poetic words. I sought to hear the voice of God and climb the utmost steeple, but God declared, go down again, I dwell among the people. Peter and John were going to the temple as usual. They were going to worship. They were going to pray. To maybe even give their tithes. And although those things might have seemed ordinary to some, and the things that you and I do may seem ordinary to many. There are those ordinary things that bring about the extraordinary visitation by God Himself into our lives. Gives us opportunities to minister. So number one, I would say to you that God works in the ordinary times of our lives. Secondly, he also works in ordinary people who are filled by the Holy Spirit. This crippled man could have chosen anywhere to be. He could have sat at the market or along the main road, but he had his friends place him near the gate of the temple. Why? Maybe he had a feeling that the people who serve God would be more helpful and more generous to people like him. As he sat at the, beg at the gate begging, I wonder what kind of response he was getting. Perhaps people passed him by on the other side of the gate. I mean, it's a big gate. Josephus tells us the gate was made of Corinthian brass. It was plated with gold and silver. Stood 75 feet high and 60 feet wide. This room. I don't know how long it is. But maybe the gates were as big as this room. It would have been easy for those worshipers to come and to pass by this man to go on the other side of the gate. Maybe some of them would drop a few coins into his hand as they came to worship. Perhaps they gave from good motives trying to help out a fellow human being. Perhaps they gave from some selfish motives so that other people could see how generous they were or perhaps they were hoping that God would take special notice of their sacrifice. Whatever the reason, here comes Peter and John. They didn't pass by on the far side of the gate. 
They just didn't drop a few coins into his hands and then hurry on. They stopped. They actually looked at him <clears throat> instead of averting their eyes. They even took time to speak to the man. What's the difference? The difference is that Peter and John, the Holy Spirit was alive and working in them. They had eyes that maybe others couldn't see. Maybe they saw something in this man that nobody else saw. How many times do we look at people and we look at them with the eyes, the human eyes, instead of seeing them as God sees them? A number of years ago, there were books written about how the church needs to have people eyes. We need to see the people that are around us. We need to see what they're going through. We need to, to try and understand them. But many times we don't, do we? Many times what we do is we avert our eyes. We have our own agenda, and so we go our own way. I often wonder how many opportunities I've missed in my lifetime. How many opportunities that, that God was revealing Himself in. But I was too busy to see I was on my way to doing whatever I wanted. People with the Holy Spirit see people differently. They understand the hurts and the needs of people. They understood that this crippled man's needs were great. And so they stopped. Peter and John were ordinary people, just like all the others that were gathering for worship that day. Really no different than you and me. I think sometimes we have a tendency to put them up on pedestals, but they were ordinary men. Amen. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were doing extraordinary things. You know, there is that scripture that, that says this, Peter was so full of the Holy Spirit that people just walking by him and his shadow got on them that they were healed. Whoa! How about that? Well, that could never happen in my life. Oh, really? The Holy Spirit so filled Peter and John that they saw something. They may have gone by that man every single day for a month of Sundays. But this day, they stopped. Thomas Aquinas was visiting Pope Innocent IV in Rome. The Pope showed him the vast treasure in the church's vault. Pointing to all the great wealth, the Pope said, No longer can the church say, Silver and gold have I none. Thomas Aquinas replied, It's true. Nor can the church say to the lame man, Rise up and walk. In other words, the church can be rich financially, but it can be powerless because the people are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the other hand, church can be dirt poor, but it can have great power because the people are filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. These were ordinary men, no different than you and me. <clears throat> Fishermen. Not educated. Poor. And yet, what happened that day? We don't have any money to give you. But we have something greater than money to give. And he took him by the hand. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he pulled him up. There may have been an absence of money, but there was no absence of power. Because the power of the Holy Spirit 
went from them into that crippled man. And he got up. Amen. And he just didn't walk. He went running and leaping and praising God. And Scripture says that those who were in the temple that day, they knew him. They had seen him sitting by the gate. And they were all amazed. What about you and me? Aren't we just ordinary men and women? Maybe we don't have silver and gold to give. But what do we do have? We have a God-given talent. We have the ability to pray. We can take time to reach out and touch the life of someone who needs Jesus Christ. God uses ordinary men and women who are filled with the Holy Spirit. He not only works in the ordinary times of our lives, and not only does He work in ordinary people filled by the Holy Spirit, but He works to meet people's needs. That's number three. This man thought that his need was a little money to buy a loaf of bread, to buy enough meat to eat. But Peter and John looked beyond the surface, and they saw that he needed more than money. This man needed Jesus Christ. Randall Earl Denny wrote, God gives what is needed, not what is asked. Jesus once said, everyone who asks receives. But when God takes over by His grace, we often get more than we ask. That beggar asked for a handout. But well, what he got was help. When Peter told him to walk, in the name of Jesus, I can see this man dumbfounded. But it says that Peter took him by the hand and raised him up. Walk! And immediately, his legs and his ankles, feet were strengthened. We should be in the business of reaching out our hand to those who are lost. To those who are in need. With the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give them more than just a handout. We can give them a hand up. We can encourage and lift up and even work miracles through the power of Jesus Christ. God works in the ordinary times of our lives. He works through ordinary people like you and me. And He works to meet people's needs. He jumped to His feet, began to walk. Then He went into the temple courts, walking, jumping, praising God. I'd like to see more of that in my life and more in the lives of other Christians. For God did not call us just to stroll around, stroll through this life. He called us to love others, to serve others, and to be available at any time in the ordinary things of our lives. For him to do extraordinary things. I think if we were that blind man or that beggar who had been lame from birth, if all of a sudden our, our feet and our ankles and our legs were strengthened and we were able to walk, I think we would do exactly what that man did. That we would just jump and leap and praise God. No matter what people thought of us. 
Well, a lot of things happened that day. That crippled man, that crippled beggar's life was changed. Because on an ordinary day, to ordinary men, filled with the Holy Spirit, saw what others didn't, and reached down. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give, I give it thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Are you ready for God to intervene in the ordinary time of your life to touch somebody with the good news of Jesus Christ? Amen. He may not be a crippled man who will suddenly rise up and walk, but maybe. But there are a multitude of people who need Jesus Christ more than they need to walk. Amen? Amen. God uses ordinary people, ordinary times of our lives. He uses people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And He wants to meet people's needs through us. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> We're ordinary people, oh God. Laborers, school workers, blue collar, white collar, retired, in school, working at school. Ordinary people. And our days are filled with ordinary things. But every single day of our lives, we need to be open to the reality that at any point in those ordinary times of our life, that you may take an ordinary person who is filled with the Holy Spirit and put them in the path to meet someone's need. May it be us, O Lord. O Lord. May we be open to those extraordinary times that come in our ordinary lives to meet the needs of others. May you encourage us with these words today. We thank you, Father, for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Please stand as we sing our closing hymn, page 326.
20, we have our great commission from Jesus. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even unto the end of